Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Once again, bow your heads. Father, it is a, um, it is a distinct, it is a distinct honor to come before you today. Um, I ask you, Lord, for your spirit. 
and a fresh outpouring of your anointing and power so that I can deliver this word to your people, which I believe has been fashioned for their hearts and their ears. Open our eyes that we might see Jesus, Lord, and lead us in the way we ought to go. We need wisdom. We need the shrewdness that is ours when we walk in your wisdom. We need your grace and more than anything, your love. Enough, not only for us and ours, but for everyone and everywhere we go. There's a song that said many years ago with the world needs now is love, sweet love. I agree, and even more so, what the world needs now is Christ, sweet Christ, the love of Jesus Christ. That is the complete thought. That is the complete thought of heaven. And what we need now in this house is more and more of Jesus. Give us understanding in these things. Speak to us and lead us in the way we ought to go, and we will follow in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen. Hallelujah. You give me a more robust amen than that. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you, Mimi. How about a shout for the worship team? Hallelujah. Oh, you can do better than that, too. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, what I am, am uh, most blessed about with the, with the worship team is that 52 Sundays a year, or however many there are, uh, they bring their best in their first. Amen. So thank you, worship team. Thank you for your consistency. Thank you for the fact that God can work in you and through you on behalf of his people. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether you've had the best week of your life or something less than that, uh, that you give your best and your first. And I am very, very grateful to be a part of that and very, very grateful to be a pastor of that, uh, a servant to that in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a word for you. I think you might know that. <laughs> if my people, dot, dot, dot. If my people, God is speaking so clearly today and you will hear him in the word and you will hear him speak not to others, but to you. Amen. All right. Just look around and say, God's not talking to you. You can tell the person, no, I'm not, not, not talking to you. He's talking to me. <laughs> He's talking to me this morning. He's not talking to you. <laughs> He's just talking to me. So I want you to, to, to handle this as a personal conversation, something that God is saying to you. And I remember when my dad um, received uh, uh, his salvation, he said yes to Jesus on a day where he came to church and uh, he hadn't been to church in many, many years. And the way he described it is when uh, uh, Pastor Bishop Saunders began speaking, he was like, everybody else in the room went away. And it was as if the pastor came and stood in front of him and looked him in the eye and preached the whole sermon. And then at the end of the sermon and when, when, when they gave the invitation, he looked to his right and his hand was up. He didn't know how it happened. And five minutes later, he was standing by the baptismal in white robe. He didn't know how that happened either. But he went down in that water and he came up a new man. Come on, church. Hallelujah. <laughs> now, uh, I might not get a chance to dump you in water today, but may the spirit of God baptize you afresh today as you hear this word amen if my people i want to talk to you this morning specifically about the church of jesus christ and i want to narrow it down and talk to you specifically about you you personally if you consider yourself a child of god if you consider yourself a member of his family if you consider yourself a member of the kingdom of god i'm speaking to you I'm not speaking to you in religious terms. I'm not speaking to you in denominational terms. I'm speaking to you in personal terms. I'm speaking to you in spiritual terms. I'm not even speaking to you directly or so much as a member of this church. I'm speaking to you as a member of the body of Jesus Christ. And while he may have planted you here and you may be a cell, we are cell in him.
don't matter, if I don't have to be satisfied, if I don't have to be right, if I don't have to come out on top, if I don't have to be justified, if people don't have to think well of me or I don't have to win, then I can relax. Amen. I'm talking to you, church. I can relax because it's not about me. It's about him. Now, I want to tell you what is about you this morning. If my people, the title of this morning's message, Second Chronicles, chapter 7, verses 12 through 16. Hear the word of the Lord. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. And will forgive their sins and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house. That my name may be there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Amen, beloved. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's find ourselves in the narrative here. You and I know that that temple, Solomon's temple, was destroyed. But yet the Lord said to Solomon that he would be there perpetually. But he said he would be there perpetually if my people. You see, the kingdom of heaven is a settled thing. My place in it. And God's place on the throne of my heart is conditional. The Bible does not, will not, and never has teach unconditional love. Don't leave. Because I know that has been sung about and written about and preached about. And we have fallen down to the altar. Thanking God for his unconditional love. Yet and still God's love is not unconditional. God's love is based on this one word. And that word is if. Now, let me tell you what, uh, what I mean by God's love. God is love. Amen. Okay, come on, work with me here. I know you're not happy with me. But God is love. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes, whosoever believes. That's a condition. God's love is activated. And it is personalized in your life and my life and on this earth in the man, Jesus Christ. God's love is just not some feeling that floats and flows down from heaven and sprinkles on us like pixie dust. God's love, love is not an atmosphere. God's love is not something that you that, that you have to walk in this place. And when you walk out of this place, God's love is not with you. But if you walk in this place, it is. I hope very much so that when you walk in this place, the presence of the Lord and the fact that he's pleased with what goes on in this place makes his presence just palpable. But yet and still, I want his presence to be palpable when I'm shopping, when I'm in Walmart. It's not limited to this room. But there's something special he does when people dedicate themselves to him to come to him on his terms. And his terms are kingdom terms. That is the if that is the condition under which you and I live. If my people. Now, we know that the Shekinah glory of the Lord rose up out of this, this temple and left this temple because of the sins of the priests and the people of the land for which they were unrepentant. And God had to bring judgment on the nation of Israel, the 10 tribes to the north. And then some hundred plus years later, because they would not repent, 
though they saw what happened to their brothers on Judah. And the temple was burned down, burned down. And when, when the temple was rebuilt, and then it was refashioned by Herod. Now we're in the New Testament. The same thing happened because of the, the, the failure to repent of God's people. The temple was destroyed. Jesus told the people in his day, as magnificent as Herod's temple was, and it was a wonder of the world, he told his disciples, in this generation, you can marvel at all these buildings and this campus if you like, but in this generation, this place will be destroyed and not one brick will be laid upon another. So what is the Lord saying when he says that, that, that he will be there perpetually? He will be there forever. I want you to hear the word forever in a different light than you've ever heard it. The word forever means nothing apart from the man Jesus Christ. You see, I can promise to love you forever. And you probably have done that. And next week you change your mind. Am I in the right church this morning? Has anybody ever promised to do something and uh, they changed their mind last week? Anybody, anybody ever promised to give something? Lord, I'm going to give. I'm going to give. Thought about it. Well, uh, uh. So when it comes to my nature, the word forever means nothing. I mean, the, 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 you can look it up, the name of songs and, and, the, and the many songs that have the word forever in them. Unless that forever is speaking about Jesus Christ, that word means nothing. Because you and I don't know what's going to happen in an hour. If I'd have told you two weeks ago, oh, there's going to be a balloon flying over the country, one end to the other, a big old balloon, everybody's going to be looking up at this balloon. And then you'd have said, really, Pastor? Uh, oh, really? Is that prophecy? Like, no, no. I mean, it, it, it actually happened. It, 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 but if I'd have told you that, I mean, because you, cause you know that I don't know what's going to happen next week, and neither do you. Many people have said they know what's going to happen, and we come to find out that they didn't because God doesn't get prophecy that we know what's going to happen next. He gets prophecy so we're prepared whatever happens next. So the balloon does fly through the country. We're prepared for it. That's what prophecy is for. And so we can say, we can look at this and, and, and say, well, this word forever is problematic. He said that to David about his kingdom and his sons. But he said, if they follow me, then your line will not discontinue. It will go on forever you're like lord well obviously that didn't happen so all this forever stuff what lord but the lord has his eye on jesus and every promise he makes he has his eye on his son jesus christ so when the lord had to destroy to destroy the kingdoms of israel the northern and then the southern his word wasn't broken his promise was sure and that forever remains because it forever remains in Jesus Christ. Hebrews 13, 8, 8. Jesus the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. That's God's condition. So when God says anything to you and to me, the condition is Jesus Christ. The condition is not a thing. The tradition, the condition is a man. Because if you and I come to God on any other terms than his son, we are not coming to God. We're coming to our idea of God. We're coming to our thoughts of God. We're coming to our religion about God. But we're not coming to God unless we come in the man, Jesus Christ, who humbled himself and came in the likeness of, of sinful flesh like me, yet without fault and without sin, and laid his life down, became the lowest Came and made himself no reputation. But now God has given him reputation. Come on, church. And if we come to God, if, if, as you know, is a condition, everything that follows, that precedes the word if and follows the word if is determined by the word if. If these things are going to match up. And when we look at this passage, verse 14. If my people dot, dot, dot. So you and I need to acquaint ourselves with God's conditions. God must have his conditions. If God is going to settle on a family, if God is going to settle on a man or a woman, if God is going to settle on, 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 a, on a group of people at church and have his way, he must have his conditions. We must lay ourselves aside. We must make it not about us. 
I must make it not about my ministry and my music and my worship team and, and, and my church and the car I drive and the house I live in. Because if God is pleased with me, I'm going to live in a great house and drive a wonderful car. Because that's the condition that some people say that if we satisfy, that, that, that that's how, what it results in. It's not what God said, not what he ever said. In fact, God may very well trust you with less. Remember the lesson of Gideon who called out to the people of God. And 32,000 men showed up, and God said, there's too many, too many. Because if you win, you're going to give yourself the credit because there's enough of you to win. And God narrowed him down from 32,000 to 300. What kind of leader are you, Gideon? God trusted Gideon with less, so much less that it was almost nothing. Because if... Gideon kept his eyes on the Lord. If, then we would be talking about him 5,000 years later. If Gideon had not trusted in the Lord, trust me, we wouldn't be talking about him. Because those people are like the chaff which the wind drives away. But the righteous man, the righteous woman, takes God at his word. And when God gives his condition by faith, they satisfy the conditions of God. Now, is God always going to be love? Yes, he is. Is God always going to love? Yes, he is. Does God have grace beyond anything that any of us would have? Yes, he does. Will God save some folks that we thought never could be saved? Yes, he will. Is God working in places where we don't even know that he's working? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Is his love unfathomable? Yes, it is. Is it unconditional and is it reckless? No. I know the great song, Reckless Love, and churches singing and people singing, and you probably bought it and sang it yourself. I'm not saying anything about that, but I'm telling God is anything but reckless. There's not a reckless bone in Jesus' body. Reckless means that I go about my agenda without consideration of the consequences. That's what the word means. But trust me. Jesus gave his life and considered the consequences of laying his life down. He considered it. The Bible said that he did, despising the shame. But now, because he kept his eyes on God, he seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. Beloveds, God must have his conditions in your life. If you're married, if God is going to bless through you, God must have his conditions in your relationship. If you're single, you're married, and your husband's name is Jesus, men and women. And if, if, if you, if, if God's going to have his way, you must meet his conditions of being faithful to him. Because how can we be faithful to a human husband and wife if we're not faithful to Christ? If my people who are called by my name. Now, God's not talking to anybody. He's talking to you. Go ahead, tell your neighbor again, God's talking to me this morning. It's, it's, and, and for this moment, it's all about me. <laughs> In this passage, the Lord is offering terms and conditions of kingdom living, kingdom understanding, kingdom dynamics, kingdom methods, kingdom ways, and kingdom outcomes. Though this conversation occurred many, even thousands of years ago, and pertained directly to the nation of Israel, its principles apply every bit as much today to you and me in the church of Jesus Christ. Right now, this very moment, this word speaks to us. Its instruction is poignant and clear, and God never, he God ever remains true to his desire to hear and respond to us when we turn to him, when we repent. I want to take the, the, the word repent, it's a big word, and I want to take it and put it in a nice small package for you to take with you to turn to Jesus. That's all it means. It doesn't mean anything more or anything less that we turn from others and from ourselves and we turn to Jesus. I'm not even going to get into the Greek with you because you don't need all that this morning. Turn to Jesus, that is repentance. Why do we repent? We don't repent necessarily because we did that wrong stuff. We don't repent because of what we've done. We repent because of who we are. I am a sinner. I am a sinner. And I can't escape that reality. Excuse me. 
give you a second to think about that. <coughs> Not about me being a sinner. What about you being a sinner? <coughs> that was the second wasn't for you to contemplate me being a sinner. It's for you to contemplate the fact that you're a sinner. Therefore, your repentance is not simply for things that you've done. But it's for who, that I, who I am. And it's not for things that I've done to others. Because all of my sin, every single instance of it, the disposition of it, is an affront to a holy God. And my repentance is based on relationship. You see... You can be sorry, sincerely sorry. You can stop doing the things for which you're sorry. Sincerely do so and do better without Jesus. You know, there are people who sit in uh, meeting after meeting after meeting and have modified their behavior. Thank God. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. But that's not repentance. Even a fool knows to stop being a fool. So I don't say that to denigrate anyone. I'm just saying that that's that falls short of repentance. Repentance has to do with a person, the condition of God. You're coming to God in the terms of the kingdom according to the blood of the lamb. That's repentance. That's repentance. David, even before he understood the blood of the lamb, uh, spoke prophetically in Psalm, in Psalm 51 when he got busted for his behavior with Uriah and Bathsheba. And God had every right to take him out. But Nathan the prophet said, the Lord has covered your sin. What do you think the Lord covered his sin with? The precious blood of Jesus Christ. But you say, well, Jesus Christ had not died yet. But did you hear me 10 minutes ago? Did, were you listening when I said Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and God has always, always dealt with his people from Genesis to Revelation according to one condition, and his name is Jesus. Don't think that Jesus isn't in the Old Testament. Jesus is the Old Testament. God has never dealt with men apart from faith. And never will because he can't deal with us according to our behaviors and our actions because he wouldn't deal with us at all. One sin makes, it, makes us ineligible for relationship with God. One. And the fact that I don't just sin, that I am a sinner, makes me ineligible for relationship with the holy God. When Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, and they were, because of what? Sin. God forgave them, the sign that he forgave them is he covered them. He covered them with the skin of animals. And what did he have to do to the animals to cover Adam and Eve with the skin? He had to shed their blood. The blood has always, always, always been the power through which God deals with us. God does not deal with man apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. That is God's condition. So here's what the Lord says to me and you and what he says to Solomon. He's speaking to Solomon about the, uh, 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 about the, the reality of his presence in that temple. Solomon built this temple. Now, we know a building cannot contain God, but God was good enough to his people to give them a place of meeting where there would be a particular place where his presence would abide and they could come and worship him in spirit and in truth. And on this place, and when prayers are lifted up, in particular, in this place, God would move on their behalf in wonderful and miraculous and healing and empowering ways. But they had to come to God according to his prescription. I remember I had a, just a long story, and I'll make it short. I received a prescription from my doctor. And I went back to the doctor two weeks later, and he uh, asked me, you know, had I completed the prescription? And I said, well, no, the, the, the symptoms went away, and I stopped taking it. I don't know if you've ever been chewed out by a doctor, but I was. And he was an older black man, right? And I, I guess he looked at me maybe like his son. I was in my 20s at the time. 
He's probably in his 50s. He looked at me probably like his son. He talked to me like a father talks to his son. Boy! He didn't say that, but that was his attitude. Go home. Go home and finish that prescription. Start it today and finish it. Do you understand me, my son? Yes, Dad. I mean, doctor. The prescription. Now, we know that Jesus is a great physician. Amen. And so when there's something that's wrong with us, Jesus knows exactly what to prescribe. And here it is, the Spirit of God prescribing to you and me in this passage how to deal with the maladies that would plague us. And so he tells Solomon, as we just read earlier, when, when you see the outworking in my displeasure, when I begin withholding rain, and, and, and when things get difficult for you guys, what is going on? And when you, when, when you, you experience in my displeasure, here's the way, here's a prescription. If my people who are called by my name, and the first thing he tells them to do is to humble themselves. Humility, I want to talk to you about that first and foremost. Humility never comes to God as if it has anything of value to offer God. It sets aside degrees, pedigree, history, tradition, agenda, accomplishment, Rightness, or anything of self at all. Self-realization, self-fulfillment, self-aggrandizement, self. Anything you put in the end of self, all that has to go. Because if you bring self, then that'll fill up all the space that humility needs to fill. Humility puts all those things aside and says, Lord, I bring nothing into your presence. Nothing except for that for which I need to repent. Now, I'm not talking about some, you know, down in the mouth kind of, oh, I'm, just a, I'm just a worm, just a worm. Yes, you are, but God doesn't need you to tell him that. He already knows what you are. You know, and God, you know, beating yourself and, and, and you know, all these vows of poverty and, 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 and vows of, you know, God's not impressed with that. Oh, I won't do that anymore, Lord. I won't eat. I won't under- eat. Eat. Just come to God and be honest. Don't bring any effort of your own because you're asking God to repay you for your own spiritual goodness. Come to God. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, humility hearkens to the word of God and the sword of God's word separates between bone and marrow, soul and spirit, the natural man and the spiritual man. It discerns the difference in those in things in all those realms so that the word of God has separated us to where we are realizing what the real issue is. And we come to God on his terms. If I come to God, for instance, about something that I'm sorry and I tell on my wife. That's not humility. Oh, Lord, this was so wrong and this happened. But, you know, and, and Lord, I, I'm Lord, as pastor of this church, I know I'm responsible for it. But really, if Dwayne hadn't have done that and if he hadn't have brought those people into the church and and if, 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 if only if only she had sung a little bit louder and if only we had if only they had done what I told them to do, then, then Lord, we wouldn't be in this terrible. As long as I'm confessing Dwayne's sin, as long as I'm confessing my wife's sin, as long as I'm confessing Heather's sin, as long as I'm confessing my mother's sin, then nah, I'm not humble. As long as I'm confessing America's sin, as long as I'm confessing my neighborhood's sin, the sins of history, as long as I'm confessing that, I'm not confessing. Humility brings itself before God. And we realize that we have to come to God on his terms. And I have to bring myself to God. And I can't repent for a single other person. For every man and every woman will give an account to God. But I come to God on his terms to present myself against you, God, and only you have we sinned. Remember Nehemiah in the book of Nehemiah when, when, when he, he stood before the king and the king asked him what it is he requested. And the Bible said he prayed. He prayed right at that second. And the Bible recounts his prayer. And Nehemiah was a righteous man, a good man, a man who feared God more than most. But he confessed the sins of Israel as if they were his own personally. God heard him. And we're talking about Nehemiah today because he humbled himself and he brought no one's wrong before God but his own. 
See, the humble man, the humble woman realizes that his and her mind and emotions and will are not sufficient to know or accomplish God's will. But we need the shrewdness of the spirit so that we will always know which way is truly, which way is right and true, which way is up. And we can walk in that way. God honors and recognizes and lifts up the humble, but he resists the proud in any other approach. Because that approach is based on pride and self-righteousness, even and especially among saints. For there is no pride, no self-righteousness like religious pride and religious self-righteousness. I shared this with the, with the team this morning and, and the Lord spoke to my heart about it. I didn't know if I was going to share this particular outlook to you today. Um, but one of the, as you know, the huge issues in our country is abortion. And the reason I talk about these things is because I, I don't want you to walk out here feeling like I feel or thinking what I think or voting like I vote. That's not, I'm not interested in it at all. That's between you and Jesus and whatever decision you want to make for whatever reason you want to make it. But I want you to understand kingdom. Somebody say amen. God, and I want you to hear this, just like you got mad at me when I said God's love is not unconditional. You might get mad at me again. God is not pro-life. Jesus is not pro-choice. So everybody's mad at me. God's not anti-abortion. God's not pro-abortion. And we can throw some other things in there too. God's not pro-transgender, anti-transgender. God's not pro-gay or anti-gay or pro-heterosexual, anti-homosexual. He's not pro-lesbian and anti-housewife none of those things i'm gonna tell you why because the kingdom of heaven is not a matter of pros and cons the kingdom of heaven is a matter of righteousness peace and joy in the holy ghost if you read your bible you know it says that in romans 12 righteousness peace Joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. But you say, Pastor, some of those things are unrighteous. So, ha ha. If you want to see unrighteous, look in the mirror. Ha ha. And you'd be right to say, touche. I don't say that to denigrate anybody's position or your passion. Uh, um, we in my family and in this church have a passion for life. And may the, the word abortion never be spoken among us, not because we're better than anybody else. Oh, God loves us better, is more pleased with our decisions than anyone else's. But that we humble ourselves before the Lord. And ask him not only to help us not to do the wrong thing, but help us to walk in the light of God. So much so that just as people were looking up and seeing that balloon in the sky this week, that people will look at us and see us looking up and they will look up and see Jesus. You see, when Jesus was sitting at Simon's table and a woman came in who everyone knew was a sinner. I don't know how everyone knew, but everyone knew. The Bible said it was obvious. She came in with an alabaster, alabaster flask, I kind of conflated those two words, of oil and poured it out on him. And then she stood over his feet, bowed over his feet, washed his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. And they looked at Jesus and they said, well, if he knew what kind of woman this was. If he knew she was gay, if he knew she was a prostitute, if he knew that she'd been divorced six times, if he knew that she was an atheist, if he knew ugh, that she drinks too much, she's a gossip, she's a troublemaker, he would never have anything to do with her. That's exactly the opposite of the kingdom of God. Come on, church. Yeah, let there be light, Cheryl. Let there be. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly the opposite of the kingdom of God he knew exactly who the woman was he knows who you are too by the way come on church 
and he receives her worship. Beloved, let's not drive people away when the Lord is looking to receive their worship. They only have to give what they have. She didn't have a life of righteousness and righteous decisions and a beautiful family and, 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 and believing children and, and, a, and a great ministry where she taught Sunday school the whole time. He, she didn't have that to offer. But what she had, which was that flask of fragrant oil and her tears and her worship. And how often do we as a church condemn that which God is longing to receive. And we block the way to the feet of Jesus Christ with our own sense of righteousness. And we forget when we were that woman. If you haven't come to God and broken open your alabaster flask or whatever you have valued and poured at his feet, if you haven't cried on Jesus' feet, and dry them with your hair or your clothes or whatever you have, you have never worshipped. If you're worshipping him out of an ounce of self-righteousness, an ounce of it, you've never worshipped until you're as broken as she was. And he said to her, he said to everyone around, you guys worship, oh, it's kind of quiet and reserved and religious, isn't it? You didn't give me a bowl to wash my feet. You didn't give me a kiss when I came in. You know, you didn't give me a little spray bottle of Old Spice when I came in. You, 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 you didn't do any of that. And here's this woman who you say is unworthy. And she's poured her best out on me. Washed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. Daughter, your sins are forgiven. Because her repentance was at the feet of the man, Jesus Christ. That's the only way to be forgiven, beloveds. I can forgive you. I can forgive you. But until Christ forgives you, nothing matters. So he says, if my people will humble themselves like this woman and pray, what is prayer? Prayer considers the awesome truth that God is interested in what we say, what we believe, the conversation that we're willing to have with him. God wants communication with you and me. He built you as a communicator. He is the ultimate capital C communicator. He is giving you the capital W word of God. And that capital W word of God has a name. His name is Jesus. See, I don't believe the words on the page in the Bible. I believe the man that the Bible reveals. I don't believe in a system of theology. I get in trouble when I talk about theology and theologians, so I won't do that today. But I don't believe in theologies and a theology for the city and a theology for the country and a theology for those in that country and that country. Oh, there's no theology. If the meaning of theology is a study of God, which the word technically means, then why do I need a theology for every little segment of society and life? Why isn't one theology Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords? Anything beyond that, beloveds, is a waste of grace. And none of it will commend you to the Father because your salvation and your relationship and your repentance has nothing to do with your academics or your scholarship. I praise God for men uh, who study the word of God, and men and women, and they have great academics and great scholarships, and they can teach you things that, that may open your eyes and blow your mind. I thank God for that. But I doubt very seriously whether that woman who bowed at the feet of Jesus Christ and washed his feet with her tears and dried it with her hair, if she knew any theology at all. I doubt if she could name the 66 books of the Bible, or even the first four Gospels. Well, they hadn't been written yet, but I guarantee she couldn't name them if they had. Because that's not what God's looking for. God's looking for those who will bow down at the feet of his son. And they will take their positions and their agendas and they will lay them down so they can rise up and see that the fields are white with harvest. People need to know Jesus. Amen? They don't need to know your positions on the issues of the day. 
They have their own positions. And you are never going to be commended by God for your positions of being right about things. You may be right. But if you're right, doesn't lead you to the feet of Jesus Christ, your right will get in the way and will block people who are trying to get to his feet. And we know that. We've seen it. We've seen it in action. We see it and hear it in action today. Do not take God and put him in the construct of your agenda, no matter how noble it is, or your nation. God is not an American. Made everybody else mad now, okay. He ain't. He's not Oregonian. And he is not, he doesn't hearken to any constructs we would put up for him. God will blow himself out of every box you put him in. And the only container that you and I have that can contain God is our faith. Come on, church. Because your faith is elastic enough, because it's a spiritual concept, it's elastic enough to keep expanding, keep expanding to receive an ever-growing revelation of the man Jesus Christ. Do you think you know everything you need to know about Jesus? That means you don't know Jesus. Does your preacher think he knows everything that he knows you need to know about Jesus? That means he doesn't know Jesus. Because the one thing I know is that with all I know, I don't know anything. I'll double up on it. I don't know nothing. Okay? I don't know nothing, y'all. I don't know nothing. I studied. I've studied for years, decades now, and I've spent my time in the Word of God. I've memorized the Word of God. I can recite chapters of the Word of God before you right now. To top of my, I do. This is what I do. I think about it in the middle of the night. I wake up in the middle of the night, think about the Word of God. I go on my walks, think about the Word of God. You've been around me any time at all. You know what I do. And I stand before you and ask you questions so I can answer for you from the Word of God. But I don't know anything. And every day, I get up and I open the word of God that I read thousands of times. Because with all I know, I don't know anything. And if I want God to lift me up, I have to humble myself. Well, God, I've read uh, the Proverbs more times than I can count, so I'm going to take the month off. As soon as I start thinking I know something, I know nothing. So the Lord tells me in this passage, if my people will call by my name, will humble themselves. Let me make it personal. Eric, if you're going to call yourself a Christian, you have to humble yourself. And you have to pray. And then you have to seek my face. <coughs> Seeking God's face means that being in his presence and realizing that presence is the most important thing in the world. It's an awesome privilege to be heard and seen by a holy God who sees us through the eyes of his son. Aren't you glad God sees you through Jesus' eyes? Woo! Moses was a picture of Jesus when, <clears throat> when God the Father looked at, <clears throat> he was so angry. He was so angry with the children of Israel because it was all that he had done. And they were in the desert at the time. All that he had done. And they saw his miracles in Egypt. They saw him working on their behalf. They, say, they crossed over a sea that he dried up. And they saw the waters heap up so that they could cross the waters. Then they saw those same waters drown the Egyptians, their enemies. And they get to a place and things get a little difficult. And they go like, I don't know what happened to God. Where he at? I'm thirsty. I want meat. Oh, this bread coming from heaven. I mean, you eat angels' food, are you gonna complain? I want his cob salad. God keeps raining his bread down from heaven. I'm tired of that. I'm like, mm -mm -mm. there's no water. We need water. We thirsty. The Lord just parted the. The Lord doesn't have a problem with water. He just parted the Red Sea. Water's not an issue, unless it's about you. And he said, Moses, he got so angry with the people one time. And, and believe me, God, this, 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 this gushy, unconditional, loving God. He said, stand out of the way, Moses. I'm going to destroy all of them and make a new family out of you. I, in, in those songs about unconditional, reckless love, you notice they don't talk about that. 
You don't talk about the God that's going to wipe everybody out. Everybody. And Moses, I'm going to make a family out of you. How about that? And Moses, Moses stood in the spirit of Christ before the Father. I said, no, Father. Your reputation is what's most important here. And if you destroy your people, what will the world say? They will say that you were not able to save your people. And God heard him. Beloved, the reason we pray and seek God's face is because he hears you. Can a man's prayer stop the hand of God? They did. And they do. Can your prayers, can your prayers affect the actions of a holy God? I'm not saying you can pray and manipulate God. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is all of these things are based on relationship with God, and that's what Moses had. God called him friend. God said he is faithful in all my house. God called him his son and his servant. And no one says no to a son and a servant. I have sons. I have a daughter. There are very, very, very precious few things they can ask me for that I won't give them. I don't own a single thing that they can't have if they come correctly. The prescription. If my people will humble themselves, will call by my name, my sons and daughters, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wickedness. See, turning from our wickedness means to realize that only God knows which way is good and which way is right. Our way is not good. I have to say that with my mouth sometimes. My way is not good, God. My thoughts are not good, God. My aims and goals are not good, God. They fall short of God. They may be good, but, but they've got one oh too many. There's a difference between a good idea and a God idea. My ideas are good, Lord, but they're not God. Because God doesn't have ideas. God never, never woke you up no more and say, I got an idea for you. Never said that. I got an opinion for you. God doesn't have opinions. Moses didn't come from the mountain with 10 opinions. Came down from the mountain with 10 commandments. Because God doesn't have opinions. He already knows what's right. Doesn't have ideas. The word of God is settled in heaven. He's not trying to figure things out like I am. So turning from my wicked ways does not only mean, beloved, it's turning from the, the, the wild and wicked, wily things that I have done. but it turns from the propensity in me to do my thing and to think independently of God. You see, as you grow in God, the standards, the standards are applied differently. In other words, if you don't know God very well at all, God does not expect someone who's been saved for a month to understand the things of someone who's been saved for years. He doesn't expect that. So, the one who's been saved for months knows less and knows less, has less experience with God. But let not the one who's been with God for years think that their experience with God is enough. And not think that they don't continually need to come to God in humility and in repentance and according to the word and the will of God, which I read today, not last week week last week's bread is stale beloveds the manna was manna for the day manna for the day the only time it lasted two days was from friday to saturday because saturday you're resting in christ and god makes miraculous provision for you 
on a day when you don't even gather. So these are spiritual terms, beloveds. If I want to encourage you in anything today, I want it to be this. Let this church be a spiritual house. I keep up with what's going on in the world. I have my thoughts and opinions on the politics of the day. I keep up with it. I'm not even happy to keep up with it. I just do. It grieves me. And I do. But I will never come to you on any terms except for the righteousness of God. And I won't tell you how to think. I won't even tell you how to process that. That's between you and Jesus. Do it on your knees in the closet of prayer. And we still may vote differently. We still may, we still may do things differently and, and think things differently, think differently about certain people. I'm sure we will. Because if all of us were alike, the church would be one boring place. And God is anything but boring. If God wanted to be boring, everybody, everybody would be the same. But God has put us in this church and we are a mosaic of the creativity and the grace of God. And all of us play an integral role in what he presents to the world, which is a people who have come to him and reckoned their very souls on the terms of Jesus Christ and that alone. So I'll finish with this, beloved. My way is not good. And it is never right. Well, I'm right sometimes. I'm right about Jesus sometimes. No, you're not. If I have any opinion on God or any thought about God or any teaching about God, that's not chapter and verse. Trust me, I'm wrong. Period. Period. And, and you know, you can go to the Christian bookstore. You can get, man, you can get bookstores. You can get books and God calling and talking. And here's the, the, the lady telling us what God has said to her and what God has prophesied of me. God does, is not talking to me through that lady. God bless her. God is talking to you by his spirit. And if he talks to you by his spirit, the same spirit by which he's speaking to her, why does he need somebody that you don't know and I don't know to confirm to us what a God that I do know is saying to me? About me, about my house, about my life. That's why God put you in the church. That's why God sets you under somebody that you learn to trust because they walk before the Lord and they can say to you, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And then when I go in and mix in the words from random folks, no wonder we get confused. And no wonder we start thinking that one and one equals three. So, beloveds, while I have made a decision to speak carefully when it comes to the church of Jesus Christ, because it's not my bride, it's his. It is also my ministry, my duty, the anointing on my life to encourage you and even warn you that your ways are not his ways. Have you ever considered that the thing that you have been doing and the thing that you are committed to just might not be the perfect will of God for you today? Have you ever considered that the way that you believe in Jesus and what you believed about Jesus might just need to grow up a little bit? You see, that's true humility. True, true humility submits itself to the authority that God sets before us in a fresh, new way. What is fresh and new about your humility? What's fresh and new about your prayer life? What's fresh and new about how God speaks to you and how you speak to others? What have we given a place on the throne where nobody should sit but Jesus. Man, I feel strongly about certain things. I feel real strongly about certain things. But woe to me if I come in this place and I preach what I feel strongly about. Woe to me. 
Jesus said these very, very simple words to Peter. Feed my lambs. And Peter was experienced enough with Jesus to know what he meant and didn't have to ask, what do I feed them, Lord? Because he was talking to the bread of life. My pledge to you, beloveds, is that's the only thing I'll ever feed you. Now, if you want to talk with me about sports and current events, take me out for a burrito. I like burritos. I take you to my favorite place, and we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. And we'll come out hopefully loving each other and respecting each other even more. I'm not going to argue and fight about it, and neither are you, because we respect each other. And maybe we'll exchange some ideas, and maybe we'll help each other. Because that's what friends do. But, beloved, my pledge to you is that every time I stand behind this microphone, and while you may hear some of my thoughts on some of the things that are going on around, you'll be able to chapter and verse me on everything. For instance, when I said God is not pro and con anything, that's a small, small human way of thinking of life. Good, bad, black, white, black hats, white hats. God's not going to be separated along those lines. It's about the kingdom. The kingdom is three things. A king, a people, and a territory. Jesus is a king. You are his people. Everywhere he sends you is his territory. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom. And you are children of the king. Don't sell yourself to any other idea, organization, think tank, party, mindset. And for those of you who are unhappy with the world, God didn't call you to protest. He called you to conquest. You are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we need spiritual understanding. I thank you that this group of people will allow me to challenge them everything they believe, even the right things. Because a challenge isn't to convince anybody to agree with what I see or my perspective. The challenge is that I would take myself before the Lord. We would come to the Lord individually and corporately. Say, change us, Lord, into the image of Jesus Christ. That we are not sufficient in ourselves for anything good. We're not caught up in our goodness, our success, how well we preach and teach and worship. But dear God, we're lost and helpless without you. So our desire is to be with you. And as we are with you, we have and we are everything that pleases the Father. You told Peter, feed my sheep. And Peter knew what to feed them. What he had been fed. The bread and the cup. Father, this morning we come before you sharing the bread and the cup. And I have the awesome privilege with the service in this house of feeding your sheep. As often as we do this, we do it in remembrance of you. And our desire is to remember you always, in everything, at every turn. That not a single decision will be made pertaining to this place. It is not set before you. We love you, Father God. Thank you for speaking to us today. Thank you for making it personal. Thank you for correcting us. Thank you for directing us. Thank you for receiving our humility. 
And we come to you in the strong and precious name of our King and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, beloveds. I want you to meet me up front, everybody. Please, we're going to share the bread and the cup together. Come. What an awesome privilege it is to just come. Come, beloveds, come. Come. Let not one be left behind. symbolism Jesus was broken for you he was crushed for me and you sometimes I wake up in the morning and thinking about nails being driven in my feet and what that must be like and then driven into my wrists the nails were, were driven into the bottom of his hand because they had to drive it into bone because other than that, the nail would just tear through his hand. And so driven into his wrist, right where the bone mass is there. And then strung up on a tree. And strung up in a way that he couldn't really support himself and he had to keep pulling himself back up because every time he shrunk down, it, it restricted his lungs. And that's how men died on the cross. They drowned. 
in their own blood. He's broken for me. Beloved, he's broken for you, broken for us. I know it's solemn, but don't let it be morbid. I'm not trying to be morbid here. Just reminding you the price that he paid, how deeply he humbled himself. I too will humble myself. If you join me in that, beloved, it's taking heat. You know, they passed a common cup around. We don't do that so much anymore, and rightly so. But it's a picture of something they all shared the same cup. And while we have our individual cups, which is good and right for, for this group, we're drinking from the same fountain. Amen. The same Savior. Whose sacrifice and blood is sufficient for all of us. I don't know what you've been through and what you're going to go through. But I know this blood is sufficient to wash away your sins and mine. Sin, beloved, is the only thing that will separate us from God. The blood of Jesus is the only thing that will wash away that sin. If you want your part in him, not just in the next life, but this one and the next, then this one needs to be washed in the blood. No one will come to God on any other terms. And God has so revealed himself to you and washed you that the world can look at what he's done and they too can come. That's the power of the blood. Not only sufficient to cleanse you, but to make you a witness and give you a testimony. Beloved, let's partake. Take a drink. Everyone lift your hands to heaven. Father, see our lifted hands and our open hearts. Thank you for pouring your spirit afresh on us, giving us direction and correction, making us pleasing in your sight. When we leave this place, Father God, my prayer is that everyone who came as they are are leaving more like you with a deeper understanding and grace to spare. We love you, sir. May we be a credit to heaven. And may men and women see us looking up and look up to see what we're looking at and see Jesus. In his sweet name we pray. Amen. Amen. I love you all, beloveds. Greet one another on your way out. I see you. God bless you. Thank you.